Mr. Ranazizi, uh, numerous seniors in my district uh, are complaining. Uh, they call my office on a regular basis because they can't get their pain medications. And, and pharmacists have stated that DA is uh, placing arbitrary and vague quotas on wholesalers and pharmacies. I also hear that DEA is telling pharmacists not to fill prescriptions that raise red flags, but has given no guidance about these. I want to give you uh, red flags. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. But considering DEA's mission to ensure an adequate, uninterrupted supply of controlled medications for patients' needs, what is DEA doing to address the impacts on patients that these confusing policies are causing? And I know we've uh, touched on this earlier, but. If you could elaborate, I'd appreciate it. To start, uh, actually, last year we were down in Florida and we trained, I think, 1,400 pharmacists on what their role is as far as corresponding responsibility and how they should review uh, prescriptions. Uh, and we talked about the red flags, and we're trying to do that in every state. The fact is, is that we we do not want patients to go without their medication, true pain patients that need their medication. We don't want that. Yeah, but please, there is no tell, quotas. Tell me what you're doing about it, because, I mean, we get calls on a regular basis. There, there are no quotas set by DEA concerning how much downstream drug goes from the wholesalers to the pharmacies. The, the wholesalers are required to report suspicious orders. They should know uh, their customers. They should do due diligence, but they have certain things they must do to reconcile an order before it's sent downstream. The pharmacies that are ordering those drugs, uh, again, have a corresponding responsibility to ensure that the prescriptions they're filling are legitimate, are, are valid, are for a legitimate medical purpose. That's exactly what happened in Sanford. In Sanford, Florida, those two pharmacies that were stripped of their registration, they were not doing any corresponding responsibility. And they were, they were wholesalers that were sending drugs to them, were not doing their due diligence, and they were filling hundreds of thousands of tablets per year. And most of those prescriptions were not for legitimate medical purpose. They were also filling prescriptions for doctors that didn't have a valid DEA registration. See, the problem is, is corresponding responsibility has quite a few different components to it. And this has been in place for 40 plus years. All right, let me, let me go on to the next one. Thank you for that answer. Does DEA meet the chronic pain patients groups and others to ensure, do they meet with chronic pain patients groups and others to ensure that agencies understand the needs and concerns of patients? And yes or no, and please elaborate. We, if, if we were asked to meet with a pain patient group, yes, we would. Um, how often do you do it? How often are you asked? We meet with treatment groups. Uh, for instance, eight, uh, American Association of uh, Opioid, uh, AATOD, A-A-T-O-D. We meet with them. We meet with uh, physicians groups. We meet with pharmacy groups, uh, specific patient groups. It's well, what, what's discussed request. during those meetings? Give me an example. We, we meet with... What, with these, uh, for instance, ATOD, we give them a trend analysis of what's going on uh, in drug diversion, what drugs are being used, then we ask them, what are you seeing? It's the same thing with community groups. We go into the communities all the time. In fact, I'm doing a community function with doctors, pharmacists, and community leaders in Weymouth, Massachusetts next month. Thank you very much yeah. for the answer. Uh, Dr. Woodcock, uh, Zyhadro. Uh, is a new uh, extended release uh, opioid approved for the market by FDA, but without any requirement uh, for abuse deterrence. I find this disturbing because FDA has taken a number of steps to make sure opioid drugs would have these deterrents. FDA has even blocked generics from entering the market because they lack abuse deterrent properties. Some brand name drug makers have changed their drug to include abuse deterrence, saying their previous versions were unsafe. 28 state attorneys general sent a letter to FDA asking to reconsider their position on Zohydro. Your own advisory council did not favor uh, approving this drug, from what I understand. The drug company's own literature says an adult could overdose on two capsules, a child could die from swallowing just one. An addict can easily crush it and receive a dangerous and potentially lethal high. Why would you approve a drug with five times 
as much hydrocone as Vatican with no abuse deterrent properties? Well, first of all, there's only one drug that we have approved that's on the market. It's a high-potency opioid that has abuse deterrent properties. All other opioids on the market do not have abuse deterrent properties. But why was that drug approved? Pardon me? Why was that drug so approved? Zohydro? Yes. All right. Zohydro so is a single ingredient high potency opioid. You can't take, you said uh, Vicodin, you can't take a lot of those if you have severe pain because it has acetaminophen in it and it will be toxic to your liver. And, and acetaminophen is a very big cause of liver failure, okay, and, some, and, and liver transplant because people are take, getting too much acetaminophen. So we need high potency opioids for people who have severe pain. But why would we uh, make sure that it has abuse deterrent prior to approval? Abuse deterrent um, is really in its infancy, unfortunately. We've approved one product uh, with abuse deterrent properties. Those are quite limited, abuse deterrent properties, and I don't want to talk about that further, but they are they are present, okay? But we have a long way to go, and almost all the opioids on the market do not have abuse deterrent properties. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, I yield back the balance of my Fair time. Action.